first of all, thank you very much, Uli. I would like to also thank um, the organizers of this event. I'm particularly grateful to Paul and Tertu for mentoring me and looking after me lots of times. Some great coffee, Tertu. Some wonderful coffee <laughs> uh, over the years. Anyway, after all this fantastic work that we've heard about, what can I talk about? So I did think about telling a few jokes, but I think that's probably uh, not necessary. So there's, but there is yet more work that we haven't heard about from Paul's life. And I think what you don't realize is that uh, Paul has stimulated and initiated a huge number of experimentalists, including myself. And as we've heard already, Paul started influencing me before I knew him because uh, he and Harold Johnson um, were both key players in introducing actually uh, the issue of Knox, uh, both fundamentally the Knox cycle that we've heard about uh, Paul's, one of Paul's great uh, discoveries, but also the issue, the, the human issue of aircraft. Now at the time in the UK, uh, we were rather fond of Concorde, although it was Anglo-French and the Americans were actually trying to get rid of it. So in fact, my PhD uh, was supported by the Royal Society and uh, Brian Thrush was my supervisor in Cambridge to work on HO2 reactions, including uh, the famous HO2 plus NO. And in fact, Richard Wayne was my external advisor and uh, he decided to send me to a, my first ever conference and that was in a place called Araba. And then I met all these famous people, uh, many of whom I'm still uh, working with. And uh, here you'll see Paul Crutzen. Now, this is just before he broke his leg. <laughs> and uh, this was after. It didn't really knock him out. <laughs> That's what I was amazed about. And uh, lots of other people. You see me over here. Karl-Heinz uh, Becker actually organized this. Um, and Tony... Cox and Stuart Penkett, who I worked with, Tony Cox was there. I later worked with uh, uh, Tony before coming to work for Paul. Hiromi Nikki has sadly passed, Dieter, Dieter Ahalt here. This was a really amazing little group of people, uh, and I had no idea I would work with either of these two people at the time because I was halfway through my PhD. Anyway, it turns out I did, and uh, I hope this is coming up. It's a bit of a so I then moved to uh, first of all finish my PhD and then to is, this, is the next slide coming up? Yeah, it's... Uh, the, uh, ah, right, okay. So, um, whilst having worked for the uh, British government in, uh, in Oxford, um, I then got the opportunity to work at Paul's new department, and here are some of the key players who I have worked with. Sadly departed Dieter Perner, Paul, of course, Geert Mortgat and Dave Griffiths, who hired me in. Uh, Russell Dickerson became a great friend of my life. We've done a lot of work with Maria. Here is the lab group that Paul was supporting, in part at least. Geert certainly brought in a lot of money as well. And uh, basically, this was a, a huge effort in the 80s. And out of this effort, from the laboratory through in-situ measurements and uh, thinking about these things, we kind of figured out over a cup of coffee in 1984 that the DOAS method, differential optical absorption spectroscopy, pioneered by Dieter Perner and Ulrich Platt in Jülich, should actually work from space. And uh, we were naive enough, I hope that's uh, moving on. Um, we were naive enough to uh, do that. But just to remind you, it was interesting to me to look back. These are my cartoons of... Uh, Stratospheric chemistry, I'm going to talk today a bit about stratospheric and uh, tropospheric chemistry and what we can see from space. But uh, this was the world, in about the time of that picture that uh, Henning nicely showed, this was stratospheric chemistry as was known. We had one NOx cycle and uh, we had basically some transfer to the stratosphere and whatnot, but a uh, very rather simplified picture. As a result of the work of Paul and uh, Mario and Susan and lots of others, this is now a cartoon of what's going on. And actually, uh, this NOx cycle under normal conditions turns out to be about dominant. And the cycles going on in the uh, 
ozone hole, it's very much this, these so-called temporary reservoir species are converted on the PSC to photolabile species, which result in this massive loss where 50% of the... So this is the planet that Paul wasn't thinking is his own, basically, but fortunately is restricted to the poles. However, one other interesting point is that, uh, actually Paul also mentioned to me in discussion, is that uh, if we'd actually put up as much bromine as chlorine, say if we'd used chlorofluorocarbons to the same extent as, uh, uh, chlorofluorobromines as the same extent of chlorofluorocarbons, uh, we would have actually uh, probably removed all the ozone everywhere, if I got that right. I think that's, uh, if you put that amount of bromine in, because this bromine reaction is about 10 times more efficient. So we had a lucky miss there, actually. That could have really been much more disastrous than what it was. Now, similarly, this was the picture of global tropospheric chemistry that Paul beginning his work. And this was essentially, we knew about some smog, but basically ozone was coming from the strat stratosphere and being deposited at the surface, and that was it. Now, we have this. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure you'll all easily take it in. But the, uh, the point on this is that we have uh, many cycles. And we just heard from Jack about this battle between production and, of course, there are loss processes. And uh, Paul made and his collaborators, and uh, Jack uh, in particular, for example, made great progress in our understanding of these things. Also, I have to say the halogens, another area where Paul uh, played a, a very important role uh, halogens coming out of basically seawater, they play a big role. And the other issue in, of course, uh, tropospheric chemistry is aerosols, and that's also a stratospheric issue. So this is much more complicated, but nevertheless, we need to know this extremely well. Now, why do we bother doing uh, um, satellite work at all to do these things? We've seen some excellent uh, measurements elsewhere, and just from Jack, some interesting uh, satellite work. But uh, I'll tell you an interesting story now because after about six months of uh, working with Geert and Dave and, and, and Paul, I had a sort of chat with my, my boss, and that was Paul. And uh, it was kind of a time where we kind of understood a bit the, the upper stratospheric ozone. And the question is, what should we do next? And I said to, in a discussion, I was a kineticist and spectroscopy at the time, and I said to Paul in this discussion about what we should do, what do you think are the most important things? And he sort of smiled and uh, turned to me and said, well, John, I'm not sure I'd tell you if I knew. <laughs> In fact, you have to figure it out for yourself, son. <laughs> and uh, that was the one, one excellent piece of advice, uh, or one of many excellent pieces of advice, to be honest, I got from Paul. And uh, so he made us think, and you were always very extremely inspirational. Uh, I love that about working for you. Anyway, uh, what's the issue? The issue is that we now have 7 billion people on the planet. Between the Neolithic Revolution, about 10,000 BC or so, uh, we've gone, we went from 3 million or so hunter-gatherers to 1 billion people in 1800 at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, essentially on biofuel with a bit of coal. Okay? From 1800 to now, it's roughly 7 billion. Uh, recently, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark Lawrence, it's now 50% of people living in cities. And uh, 5 billion more people since Paul was born are on the planet. And this is a huge, having a huge impact. And I'll come back to that in the end. So mankind is now a real player, and that's really uh, this idea of anthropocene really brings that together. That's one of Paul's best ideas. If you haven't won the Nobel Prize already, you should probably get it for that idea. Anyway, if we want to measure from space to try and understand what's going on, we want to measure lots and lots of species. This is an issue for agencies which do not like to give out money. Uh, so actually, this shows the scales. This is actually uh, an academy graph which shows scales going from very fast, short-lived radicals to long-lived species and mixing ratios. A, a first semester physics problem is well known to many people, you have to sample better than the time, you have to sample faster than you're actually the time scale of your process. This is often forgotten in, 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 in an atmospheric science, so we're not necessarily sampling correctly. And we'd really like to measure all these things, and yes, we do need all of them. CO is here, Jack was talking about, tropospheric ozone, aerosols, lots and lots of species. Physically, we can't measure everything, but then in Mainz, we had the idea that we could probably, using this DOAS idea, 
and there were many fathers of DOAS, so uh, I'm just here as a representative of them. Um, but what we could do, we had to figure out what we wanted to do first. Well, low Earth orbit is cheaper, but actually for the troposphere, not so great. On the other hand, uh, for the stratosphere, probably once a day is about right. And uh, basically, looking at all these scales, what we really need is uh, a well-matched low Earth observation and geostationary uh, system, and that's what many of us have been working towards. And, uh, but we had to demonstrate that this system works. So the cheapest thing to do first is low Earth orbit. And uh, we then, we were completely naive, and uh, we proposed it. Now, one thing I also learned from Paul is to be perceptive and per persistent. So we actually had a maps in Europe as well. It got nowhere uh, and was completely ignored by the agency. And I remember Paul saying, you've got to watch these satellite people. They waste a lot of your time. <laughs> uh, and indeed, they do. However, the goal is to have an observational system. And we got better at doing it. And then we had a golden year, so to speak, between 1988 and 1989, where we had uh, siamaki, which is a Greek word. Christos can pronounce it better, and Maria can pronounce it much better, which means hunting shadows. OK, this is this scanning, imaging, absorption spectrometer. So that we managed to win through. And I'm sure that the Enquete Commission played a big role in that. We were going, it's like going through a city on green lights. As a young person, I thought this was normal. But in fact, uh, I now <laughs> found out later on there are a lot of stop lights and stopping you. But we got this thing going. And we didn't just get that going. ESA was then interested in a small version, which we originally called Sky Mini, which became GOM. And we actually got GOM up in 1995 which was very fast by, by so six years or so to get something up was very good going. However, we had lots of setbacks. We proposed Geoskia in uh, 1998. It's going to be realized as the European Sentinel-4 in 2020. Okay, so we had successes, but processes sort of taking over. I think we're really behind schedule. Okay, what we're doing in Saimaki, we originally had two instruments measuring limb nadir and occultation. So we're in a sun-synchronous orbit. So this, the satellite comes around the back. We do an occultation. Well, we first of all do a limb, then an occultation. That means looking at the sunrise. Uh, so this is in, in basically dawn, dawn time prior, prior to the sun coming up. And then we're doing alternate limb and nadir because there was a cash crisis and we lost one instrument. So we're trying to look at the two because we actually want to pull out at the end of the day residual method, tropospheric ozone, like, like Jack did. But I'm not going to show that. I'm going to show uh, some of the other things we measure, um, because we've seen that from Jack, that works very well. But here are the three measurement modes, and this is this matching mode that we have. These are then the targeted species. So this is passive remote sensing, and we are basically atomic and molecular scientists who are uh, physicists and chemists, uh, physical chemists who understand these spectra and the quantum mechanics, and we try to use them as fingerprints to identify species in the atmosphere. As in the lab, so this is just like a big lab, and uh, this whole program resulted in Max DOAS, uh, GOM, MVSAT, and, and more, it's growing. The whole program is growing, and uh, not fast enough because we need this data. And we can measure certain selected species. We can't measure everything. Uh, in the uh, UV visible, we have certain electronic vibrational species or overtone species down here, CO2 and methane, which you can measure. And I'm going to show you some results of that. Now, this was the uh, review. And uh, they said they thought it was a little bit overambitious. Okay, I actually don't think we were ambitious enough. I think we're data short. I don't think we're data rich. I don't think we have enough data to, because of the speed of which we're changing things. So I think that was an uh, underestimate of the reality. Anyway, after a lot of work, uh, this was the first Ariane 5 that actually worked. So we had a big party around the world, actually. Uh, Previously, the Ariane 5, excuse me, go back. Um, and previously, the, oh, previously this had, uh, um, the Ariane 5 was in, in, in not so good shape, but this was a beautiful, perfect launch. And we had 10 years of measurements before it finally, uh, MVSAT suddenly and unexpectedly in April, um, in April actually on, on Easter Sunday in uh, 2012, gave up the ghost. And, uh, as a good Catholic, I hope it's going to come back on at Whitson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, what about the legacy of this instrument? Well, I want to come, first of all, back to uh, an old problem. Now, these are new measurements. So I'm showing some new measurements now. This is aerosol, uh, basically, um, extinction. Okay, over this 10-year data record, 
and we're at 35 to 40 south, and we're just showing uh, some data. Now, interestingly, up here, uh, when we actually analyze that, we're seeing an increase, and we think that's back to Paul's idea of COS, actually increasing, the increasing amount of COS in the troposphere is producing background aerosol. These things are down here, are volcanic, small volcanic eruptions. These are not Pinatubos. Uh, and we even see, uh, from my Australian friends, Black Saturday, which was a bushfire of pyrocumulus uh, nature. So this is an data set we've just brought onto the market, so to speak, and is being analyzed globally. There's lots of interesting science in this. And to test our theory, uh, and people like Paul should have bright ideas about using this. Okay, this is another. Now, this is the trends of ozone. This shows why I'm so sad that we don't have limb measurements. Now, this is also seen in other instances. This is the decade of 2002 to 2012. And what we're showing is that, oops, if I hold it the right, uh, what we're showing is an island of loss. So these are rates of loss per um, year, okay? Uh, and we're seeing loss, unexpected loss here, and to some extent, unexpected gain here. This we understand, which is the result of the Montreal Protocol, the increase of ozone in the upper, uh, upper stratosphere as a result of that. But these things, I don't think we really understand. And I think this might be dy dynamical control. I think that's something that we're going to have to look at. So there's some new interesting issues. What about the nadir? And this is probably what it's most famous for. We now have this European early morning uh, set of satellites. Uh, they uh, cross the equator at... Uh, the first one, GOM, crossed at, oops, I keep doing that, sorry, uh, 10.30, 10 o'clock and 9, they followed one another. You might call this the B train as opposed to the NASA A train. Um, now, I've got lots of nice pictures and we've seen quite a lot of those in the hole, but one of the interesting things we found out is this dynamical control again in Bremen. This is work of Mark Weber and others that basically this is the amount of heat being shoved down and the holes, uh, when you make this, uh, March to September northern hemisphere and uh, September to March ratio for the average monthly, they all fit on a very nice linear uh, plot, which is now being, uh, and this is telling us the dynamical control. So you, at the moment, I don't think we need new chemistry, which I think is what Susan was saying, but it's a question of understanding the dynamics. However, there's a lot of devil in the detail here, uh, but this is what we need to follow. And there you go, we have split holes. All of these weirdo situations actually fit on the line, surprisingly. Okay, now what about, this is the perfect uh, molecule for remote sensing. Ulrich Platt knew that already with Lisa Perna in the 1970s. Um, I'd just like to say I believe that's the I-70 up here. Uh, that's emissions from the highway between uh, Denver and uh, whatnot. But we'll see, what you can easily see here is tropospheric NO2 is showing pollution. And it's showing, this is also pollution down here, by the way. I haven't got that on. But uh, it's showing biomass burning, which we were talking about before with Jack. And uh, it's showing, this is a great thing that we together with Paul, shipping emissions, okay? And also Ulrich's group, uh, so we used both Go and Simaki together, found very interesting things of this, and I'll come back to that briefly. Um, but that's not the only thing, of course, we're seeing lots of flow out. In fact, here, low flow out that way, and here flow from America and also flow from uh, outside of it. So this, basically, this is also telling us about transport and transformation. Now, if you actually look at one of the things we were surprised about, we published first of all in Nature in 2005, when you look at the graph and you start in the beginning of 1966, when we had about half a year's measurements, we knew the instrument was working well, go, and then do the careful averaging. So this is work now of Andreas Hilbel and Andreas Richter. Andreas Richter did the first work. And we take these uh, USA, uh, Eastern USA, Europe, Gulf, uh, Japan, uh, East, basically, uh, China, mainland, India a bit. Okay, we, look, we just separate these out and look at them. What we were staggered to see was the increases in uh, China. These are just massive. And uh, there was a slight maybe slowing down during the Olympics and as a result of the economic decay, but it's already taken off again. Okay, in comparison, Europe over here, uh, this sort of funny color, is sort of going down. And this is a result of... Um, this is a result of, of, of our, our legislation in Europe, okay? This is especially for RAM. This shows the increase in India uh, per year. Look at these. This is amazing, uh, these increases. And in India, we're seeing a change of fleet, and we're therefore uh, in very good situation to uh, 
basically go from an agricultural society to an urban uh, new modern fleet. So we're in, it's a very exciting experiment going on in, in uh, uh, India where we have massive amounts of smog. This is a very nice plot which shows again the ship routes which we picked up. And this is uh, Siamaki. This is going to the follow-on. It's going back and forward. And so, uh, Mark, we also became human dimensions because the change of these shipping routes is a result of uh, pirates. Uh, and the ships are trying to go further away from uh, basically the Straits of Hormos, which is where they're being attacked. Okay, so we were able to pick. There's amazing things you can pick up. Okay. Um, Together with Maria, we uh, investigated uh, uh, Glyoxa for the first time. So this is an OVOC. So we have NOX and we have OVOC, and from Jack and others we have Trospheric Ozone, and we need to bring these together. So this is just a, a demonstration, first of all, of our remarkable uh, finding of, of, of this strong signal from, of Glyoxa, which is an oxygenated volatile organic compound along with uh, formaldehyde, which we've been doing for a while. Uh, going back to Asia, this is our SO2. So these instruments, first of all, pulled up SO2. This is a huge increase again over the years. Di uh, a seasonal cycle, increasing, increasing. This was the cleanup in China, but we think it's increasing again. And uh, this is actually not a wrong point. This is volcanic eruption close by, uh, which Andreas picked out and explained. So SO2 going really well. On methane and CO2, what you can see is really on the CO2 side over land, you can see the boreal forest breathing. Okay, so uh, we have a look at these. You can see up here uh, how the, this, this cycle, okay, it's being plotted out down here. And on methane, you can see the rice paddy fields. So these, are, these were phenomenally new measurements. What we need is much better spatial resolution to be able to tie down sources. Okay, you can see then from these things cities, but we have to average a lot. So I'm now coming to the final bit, don't worry. Um, this is the question, of course, wetlands. This is going from spring to late summer. Uh, and we see huge uh, increases of wetlands. But what's going to happen to the permafrost? Big question for the climate scientists. How much stuff will come out? We need to measure these things. This is the future. We'd like to go to carbon sat, go to one kilometer or two kilometer resolution. This is Berlin. And you can see where we've been at and where we want to get to. We want to be able to decide where things are coming from in, across a city and measure these things globally. Uh, this new approach, which hopefully comes in the 2020 period, from ESA, this is our new idea, or one of them. Uh, and you can see we have a constellation of them. We can get daily measurements at one kilometer. And therefore, and, or of the order of one to two kilometers, and thereby measure power stations, landfill sites, and constrain them. OK, last idea is new initiative also used this International Space Station, which is a bit like an Eiffel Tower. It's wonderful to have the astronauts up there, but we want to use it for science. And uh, we've put a skier ISS idea together. Okay, summarizing. We've had a great decade. Actually, when you begin these things, everybody says it won't work, it's got no chance, and then uh, that's the period of, of, of rejection. Then you have a period of, well, we've got a bit of money over, thanks to the Enquete Commission, we can perhaps get a satellite together. Then when it gets up there, everybody says, how come it isn't better? <laughs> anyway, um, we've been doing well, but I think we've missed out on kind of, we've got to get a generation of new instruments together. And uh, we need these uh, hotspot measurements. As an addendum, so this is not really taking up the time, I'd hope that we can, um, in the next phase of the Anthropocene, I'd really hope that we can change from the hunter-gatherer mentality, so prevalent in, in North America, of extensive resources, no problem, to a kind of guardian of the planet. And I hope that we can help that along by providing objective evidence base for policy making. Paul and I are still in action together. Here's a recent conference. Thank you very much indeed.